Every December when the snow hits the ground and the Christmas music starts playing on the radio, you know it's time for the holiday traditions to come out in full swing. Some people like to go out and chop down their own tree to decorate, or if you're like me, you finally build that Halloween gingerbread house that's been sitting around since October. But something that everyone can enjoy during this time of year is watching all the Christmas specials that air on TV throughout the month. December is the only time of year when you can catch them all airing, so it feels more magical watching them like this. Growing up, we watched a lot of Christmas specials throughout the holiday season, like A Charlie Brown Christmas and the animated How the Grinch Stole Christmas that was co-produced by Chuck Jones. But aside from these, there have always been a separate few that have stood out, even all these years later, for their creativity, nostalgia, and of course, visual quality. And those are the Rankin Bass specials. Even if you're not familiar with the name of the company that made them, I'll bet there's a pretty good chance you've seen their iconic Rudolph production before, as it's been aired on TV every year since its release in 1964. But they made a lot of other iconic specials too, including Santa Claus is Coming to Town and The Year Without a Santa Claus. While I still love these specials as an adult, it's especially fun to rewatch them with a better understanding of animation and learn how Rankin Bass were able to make such a special feeling. In fact, a large portion of that is attributed to the stop-motion character puppets themselves, and how they were able to feel so alive in front of the camera. Their movement can be described as something magical, a technique fittingly called animagic. However, all the years and even decades that have passed since the specials were created, it's resulted in a lot of forgotten history surrounding their production including the fate of the puppets themselves, an important piece of television and Christmas history. Surprisingly, there isn't a lot of discussion about the Rankin-Bass Christmas specials online, so unless you grew up with them like I did, there's a chance the younger generation might not be familiar with them. Actually, Rankin-Bass didn't just make Christmas specials, but a whole variety of seasonal content some of which is really obscure. The company was founded by Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass in September 1960, originally under the name Videocraft International. Only a year after forming, they would release their first production, titled The New Adventures of Pinocchio, a TV series that ran for 130 five-minute segments, followed by their first holiday special, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, three years later, in 1964. As a kid, I always thought Rudolph was a character Rankin Bass created for the special, but actually, their adaptation is based on a 1949 song by Johnny Marks, which is in itself based on the original poem written in 1939 by Robert May, Marks's brother-in-law. The poem was published in a booklet by the Montgomery Ward department store, with 2.4 million copies having been distributed in its first year so the little reindeer had already come a long way since then. But the Rudolph that we're all familiar with was written by Romeo Muller, who also wrote the screenplays for several of the other Christmas specials from Rankin Bass. Muller's adaptation was inspired by the 1949 song, but he stated he would have preferred to base the script more heavily on the original poem, but couldn't find a copy at the time. As a result of using the song instead, Muller made several new characters inspired by the lyrics, and is credited as the creator of all the main characters in the special, including Sam the Snowman, Yukon Cornelius, and Hermie the Elf. Which, by the way, his name is truly Hermie, and not Herbie, as is commonly used in merchandise material. According to Rick Goldschmidt from the Enchanted World of Rankin Bass website, Muller's scripts always spelled the name Hermie, and never Herbie. Arthur Rankin Jr., along with his staff of artists, created the concept designs and storyboards right in their New York City offices, which is where the company was headquartered too. But that's not necessarily where all the work for Rudolph was done. When it came to actually filming the special with their animagic technique, that was done across the globe in a completely different country, Japan. Before the filming of Pinocchio had even begun, Rankin visited Japan looking for studios that could produce the series, 
one of the first times a Western studio outsourced their production to studios in other countries. Rankin ended up partnering with Japanese stop-motion pioneer Tadahito Tad Mochinaga, leading the animated series at Dentsu Studios. And when it came to Rudolph, Tad was also the guy who made it happen. With nearly 20 years of stop-motion experience in Tad's resume, Rudolph was filmed at his studio, MOM Productions, in Tokyo, in what was essentially a collaboration between Rankin and Todd. The specials were scripted, storyboarded, and designed in New York, but those assets were then sent to Japan, which is where the puppets were made and the animation process occurred, called Animagic. As mentioned earlier, Animagic is a stop-motion technique where the animators would move a puppet one frame at a time and shoot it. This kind of animation has become iconic with these characters, and I can't think of any other stop motion that looks quite like this. It's synonymous with the Rankin Bass specials, and industry professionals have often described it like toys coming to life, the viewer shrinking down to another world and feeling like you're really part of the story. And that's probably what got me to remember them for all these years. But it's not just me that has kept Rudolph going, it's really everyone that watches the special. Since 1972, CBS has been airing the special and came out with a digitally remastered version in 2005 that was rescanned from the original 35mm print. In fact, the 50th anniversary of the special was celebrated in 2014, and in only a couple years will be at its 60th, still played all throughout December. New ornaments, plush toys, and even cereal is being released every holiday season. It's the Rankin Bass version of the character that everyone remembers when they think about Rudolph. But when you think about all the Rudolph merchandise that you could buy to celebrate the season, it might make you wonder about the original puppets that were used in the special, and if somehow those could be located for a Christmas display. This is something I actually thought about for the first time several years ago, after having rewatched the specials now that I'm older. How cool it would be to own one of those original puppets. I didn't think this was anything most people would consider or even care about, especially since many of those in my generation who had watched the specials probably wouldn't care about buying an actual figure from it. Interestingly, the idea of finding Rankin Bass puppets didn't really exist for over 40 years, from the time of Rudolph's production until the mid-2000s, but has since developed a cult following. At the time of their creation, no one could have predicted the importance of these specials in the decades to come, so those involved with production had no means or desire to preserve the puppets. It wouldn't be until 2006 when their existence was put into the public eye, in a now famous segment from the PBS program Antiques Roadshow. The series is about ordinary people who find old or vintage items that might be worth something, and get them appraised by experts in the field. In this segment, a guest comes forward with a Rudolph and Santa puppet, claiming to be the originals from the special. And while you might have some doubts about their legitimacy, especially since this is their first appearance in over 40 years, his story explains it all. My aunt worked at Rankin Bass Productions for about 10 or 15 years in the 70s and early 80s, and she acquired all of them, and they were the production puppets from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Including Rudolph and Santa, we had Yukon Cornelius, Herbie the Misfit Dentist, and a few others, uh, including a sort of reindeer that got melted in our attic, um, thanks to my mom. We used to have them around the Christmas tree growing up, and I'm just used to having them around. These are indeed the original puppets used in the production of Rudolph by Rankin Bass. Even the appraiser gets a little nostalgic seeing them, stating it was like seeing old friends. When this segment originally aired, their value was set at between $8,000 and $10,000, which nowadays seems like a small price to pay for television history of this level of importance. But what was even more important at the time was getting these into the right hands and making sure they could be restored and preserved. They had without a doubt seen better days, and the nephew at the time had no interest in holding on to them. Thankfully, someone stepped forward and did just that. Behind the scenes, the nephew was approached by toy aficionado Kevin Kreiss, with an interest in purchasing them, and a sale was made for both in 2007. Still, even with a new owner, 
they needed to be preserved, and shortly after, a connection was made between Kevin and Los Angeles film collective Screen Novelties, who was interested in preserving the puppets. They were flown out to the studio and immediately authenticated, further proven by a piece of Japanese newspaper that lined Santa's boot. Restoration was led by puppet fabricator Robin Walsh, a process that was showcased in a segment from the Animagic of Rankin Bass documentary. For the next several years, the restored puppets were featured in news segments throughout the country and went on convention tours with Kevin, until he eventually sold them to a private collector named Peter from New York. It's not known how much the puppets were sold for at that time, and it's unknown for how many years Peter owned them, but in November 2020, Peter put them up for auction himself. They were expected to reach between $150,000 and $250,000 but the final amount reached as high as 368000 breaking everyone's expectations of what they would have sold for. What's more is the buyer of the puppets, who has remained anonymous, donated them to the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia, on long-term loan. And as of 2022, they are still on display and a feature attraction of their Christmas events. So it's unbelievable that these puppets have made their way from a hot attic where they likely would have been forgotten into a museum where they can be preserved and viewed by everyone. I'm glad that all the previous owners have been able to take care of them and forward them onto a new home so they didn't end up becoming lost again. Out of all the Rankin Bass puppets that were made, I can't think of any two besides Rudolph and Santa that were more worthy of being the ones to represent their body of work. However, this triumph of preservation does largely end here for Rudolph, as was previously stated in the original appraisal story. The same secretary that got Rudolph and Santa from the Rankin Bass offices in New York also had the other characters, Hermie, Yukon, and a few other reindeer, totaling nine puppets. But all of these ones melted away from poor storage conditions. The reality of the situation with these puppets is exactly as the nephew said, they were used as decorations around the house, kids played with them, and no one was aware of the future significance the pieces would hold. Rick Goldschmidt's website describes the composition of the puppets, and states, The materials used were flexible, and sprayed down with a type of flock to avoid reflection for filming purposes. The spray had some acidity to it, and eventually would cause the figures to deteriorate over time. Jules Bass explained, a few recreations were made in lasting materials to display in their office, but the average life of a real Animagic figure was about six months. While the animation was conducted by Tadahito Mochinaga, the actual puppets were made by Ichiro Komuro. Santa's head, for example, was carved out of wood, hollowed out, and then glued back together, while Rudolph's nose was originally outfitted with a custom 12-volt light bulb that emitted heat and damaged the puppet throughout its use. In a 2007 interview, Arthur Rankin Jr. confirmed that he too owns a Rudolph puppet that he puts out every Christmas, though unfortunately he's passed away since then, and it's unknown what happened to that particular piece he mentioned. As unfortunate as it is to say, these puppets weren't really made to last, and when you think about it in this context, Romeo Muller's creations have essentially all been lost to time. In a way, the films themselves created an archive of these puppets and characters that we'll never really be able to have in their raw physical form. Arthur Rankin Jr. gets into more details about the connection between the puppets and the actors who portrayed them in an interview from 2005 with METVLegends.org. Remember, there are people who are acting as an actor that are motivating and moving the characters. So they're just like, a, just like a, a Disney animator, someone who is animating an early Disney film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Well, Animagic is very similar in that way. The actor is instructed, pardon me, they've been given directions, and usually I was there, and I would talk to them and say, now this character does the following thing, and blah, blah, blah. And then they would take my direction 
and hopefully recreate that in, in their character. However, this is definitely not the end of the Rankin Bass puppet story, because Rudolph and Santa were not the only Rankin Bass puppets to resurface over the years, and several more characters from different productions have shown up. A couple years ago, I did a huge internet search hoping to find any pieces from the specials, but never found any for sale. It's unlikely I'll ever end up with a puppet or prop, but I did find quite a bit of treasure and information that's been archived for everyone to see. While it's true that the life of the puppets wasn't very long, and it's not exactly easy finding new ones that have survived all these years, contrary to popular belief, the figures weren't as disposable as people might believe. As Rick Goldschmidt explains in his blog, which is where the majority of these rare photos come from, a lot of misinformation regarding the puppets has been spread over the years, leading to the belief that they weren't valued or cared about at all. It's been said that Rankin Bass would occasionally give away the puppets to the actors that voiced the characters, or to people that worked at the company, though there are still many that ended up in the wild. In 2003, a Father Time puppet from Rudolph's Shiny New Year made an appearance at the Museum of Television and Radio event. There are additional photos from Rick Goldschmidt's blog in 2017 that show Father Time from two different angles, and Sister Teresa in one of the photos. Another special, Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas, has some surviving puppets as well. Frosty was first seen in this 1979 photo that was taken on the set of the special, but a later picture from 2001 with Arthur Rankin Jr. showcases a whole sleigh display with Rudolph in front. But then in 2014, an exhibit would be put together that was so special, it reunited a large portion of the puppets, together for the first time. This was an event that was made to celebrate the work and history of Rankin Bass, held at the Masterworks Museum of Bermuda Art. On display were a variety of different pieces from different Christmas specials, including sets containing original puppets from Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas, the Great Ack from The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, and Santa and Mrs. Claus from The Year Without a Santa Claus, one of my favorite specials, all complete with lighting and film cameras to give viewers a feel of being on the set. As unbelievable as it is seeing these scenes recreated for the first time after all these decades, something even more unbelievable is that a lot of these puppets were sourced from Japan and brought to Bermuda for the exhibit by producer Masaki Izuka. Rick further explained that he believes the majority of puppets actually stayed in Japan, and that Izuka was very particular about how they were displayed, wanting them to be pinned to the floor as they were on the original sets, and not posed with doll stands. There's a huge level of respect for the work that was put into these creations, and what they mean to so many people around the world. In May 2017, a different exhibit was held at the National Film Center in Tokyo, featuring the work of Tadahito Mochinaga, and it too included additional puppets of Santa, a reindeer, and a donkey that he held onto before his passing, further proving that Japan is still the home to many of them. Rick also explains that they're finding new puppets all the time, and it makes you wonder how many copies of each character were made. There are at least two puppets each of Rudolph and Santa that have survived, so maybe more of the Rudolph characters that melted in the attic are out there somewhere. I'd personally love to find the Miser Brothers, but as far as I could tell, those haven't resurfaced at all yet. There were models of them at the Bermuda exhibit, but they weren't the originals used in the special. When I was searching all over the internet a few years ago for Rankin Bass puppets, I was surprised by how few of them have left the inner circle of artists and associates. There was only a single listing from eBay that must have been sold years ago, containing two elf characters from the movie Marco in really rough shape. The seller claimed they had been obtained legitimately, and they certainly look authentic, but it's unfortunate there isn't better documentation on the missing characters. Though in some kind of way, that gives a new meaning to the puppets, like a Christmas gift that keeps on giving, because you never know when a new one will show up, and that makes them a large piece of lost media in their own way too. Another unfortunate reality, not only for the puppets, but from Rankin Bass's history, 
is that so many of the people who created these specials have passed away, and along with them are the stories of what it was like working on these creations. For that reason, it's important to keep their history alive as well, which is something that the historians and TV networks do every year by keeping the Rankin Bass spirit going. It's heartwarming to think that a little Japanese shop gave life to all these characters and that Rankin Bass influenced so many viewers around the world with the work they put into these specials. I'm sure none of the people behind these specials could have predicted that almost 60 years later, they're still broadcast on TV every year and are one of the defining moments of the season. When you watch these specials for the holiday season, think about how far Santa and Rudolph had to travel to make it onto your television screens, and how they're still around after all these years. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other Lost Media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.